series that we've initiated uh, for you, the uh, public, and and people on our uh, on our guest list. Folks, we we decided to put these series on because we see a real need. You know, in these uncertain times, uh, there's uh, people are really having to make some big big decisions in their life. And uh, of course, a lot of those decisions need a lot of good information. So this series of webinar will continue. We'll have another one in a fortnight's time. And it, again, it's all about giving and providing great information. Today, we're really privileged to have uh, amongst us Tony Alexander. And uh, for those people who don't know Tony, he has a, a, an esteemed background, 25 years as Chief Economist of the BNZ. Uh, and then two years ago, he decided he wanted a new challenge in his life. So he decided to set up his own uh, business and go out on his own. And uh, in a very, very short time, Tony has established himself as the uh, key commentator on the, on the market. A slight tilt towards uh, real estate industry, but also a uh, tilt towards the Auckland economy. So he brings a massive amount of information that our people will use, I believe, in making decisions going forward. Um, in my mind, I, I see Tony as the real expert, and that's why we, we call this session today, What's the Expert Thing? The reason I say that is that Tony, I believe, doesn't just look at analytics, analytics numbers. He actually talks to the people at the coalface and he's continually surveying our industry, talking to our people. Uh, so he's getting the information real early and he's then putting that back out into the marketplace to help people like yourself make these decisions. Tony, it's a real pleasure to welcome you along. Thank you for giving up your time. Um, I'd like to start today's uh, talk around debt. Now, I know we had an inherent fear around debt. And I, I know uh, at the beginning of this uh, lockdown, Grant Robinson said that uh, they had a 3.6 billion fund of money to, to fund the lockdown. He did also say that it was a billion dollars a week to do the lockdown. And it lo looks like at level three uh, over the next couple of weeks, we could be seven, eight weeks into this uh, with a little bit of luck. Uh, so we're talking $8 billion. It's a lot of money for a lot of people to think about. What's your take on this, Tony? Okay, look, thanks uh, for that, Len. And can I just check that my uh, voice is coming through okay? Very good. All okay, good. thanks for thanks for that. Uh, Craig Smith put the, uh, put the hand up just there. Okay, yeah, look, thanks for that. Um, yeah, certainly when we saw this whole thing blowing up in the first lockdown and the borders closed, something relatively new uh, last year, uh, there were a lot of uh, expressions of concern about debt levels in New Zealand, with the government eventually, of course, announcing that special fund of about $50 billion to help our economy through this. And one of the key things I pointed out to people at the time was that New Zealand has an established record of getting high debt levels back down again, of moving from budget deficits back into a budget surplus position. And some of the numbers I cited back then were that in 1972, um, before it all really turned to custard in New Zealand, the ratio of uh, gross government debt to GDP uh, was about 5%. And then 20 years later in 1992, it was 55%. Uh, but we got that back down to about 6% in uh, 2007, just before the global financial crisis uh, came along with both Labour and national governments uh, running budget surpluses over the majority of that period uh, of about 16 years. And uh, that came about not really because of tax increases, apart from Labour's 39% uh, tax rate uh, there, but good control of spending. That's the sort of thing that was put in place uh, predominantly by uh, Ruth Richardson, but then also the finance ministers after that um, as well. And as we go forward from here, uh, my view is very much all it's going to take is for the government to exercise that similar sort of discipline and good assessment of uh, spending proposals as they come forward um, in order to move us eventually back into surplus and get those debt levels down again. So that's the first thing. We've got a good established record. Um, second thing, not a single credit rating agency or fund manager overseas, frankly, gives a hoot about New Zealand's uh, uh, debt level. None of them have expressed any concern about the starting point going into COVID-19 or where the peak 
for the debt ratios will be. And uh, predominantly that is because even at our expected peak in the ratio of government debt to the size of our economy, we're going to be below the starting points 18 months ago for most other economies over the around the world that we compare ourselves with. And I was just having a look at the uh, Treasury uh, documents on this from back in May, I think it was, where they used some data from the International Monetary Fund, which makes various adjustments to different levels of government to make the numbers directly comparable. And so what they have is that New Zealand's peak debt to GDP ratio, using their criteria, is about 24% in uh, 2024. And Canada, about 32%. Um, they had Australia there sitting at uh, 55%. Uh, the Euro area, 81%. United Kingdom, 102%. And the United States, 111%. We just don't even register on anybody's, uh, you know, credit rating agency list of concerns overseas. So I'm not expecting that we will have to see sort of fiscal restraint, uh, tightening policies, or tax increases to uh, to have debt at comfortable levels in the future. And clearly, while, while you said uh, a lot of concern about debt, not really, given the uh, 37 billion or so that New Zealand households have added to their debt. Um, over the past day year, people actually love debt, especially, of course, when it comes to the uh, to the housing market. So I don't really think this is going to be something that's going to cause any great perturbations in New Zealand until maybe many years down the track when something new and bad is going to have to come along at the same time as a second bad and new thing and maybe a third one as well. So yeah, another earthquake and the pandemic. Then you'll find me expressing some concern. Man. Thank you. Thanks, Tony. Uh, I should have said at the beginning too, folks, if you've got questions, you can put them into the uh, chat, chat box down the bottom there, or you can uh, hold off and ask Tony questions at the end. He's finally uh, said he would stick around, and uh, if you've got questions you want to put to Tony, we can we can raise those at the end. Um, I'm going to turn the, the, the talk a little bit towards housing now. Um, you know, we're continually being told by a lot of commentators and uh, by the government that we've got a housing crisis, uh, which I think quite a few people would accept. I'm going to give you a little bit of a, an exercise, Tony. If you had all the power that you needed, how would you fix uh, the so-called housing crisis? What would you, what would you do what, if you were in charge? Okay, so if my decision was to favour new buyers over every existing owner of property, because that's what you're asking here, basically, to forget about the interest of the 64% of the population who already own property and only think about the maybe 40 to 50,000 uh, first home buyers, you know, couples, etc., um, of each year, and you sort of get your answer. Why politically would a government actually do that when the bulk of the votes are obviously from the middle uh, sector in New Zealand? who are largely property uh, owners, many people who have already bought or want to buy investment property to help finance their retirement, and uh, really have no interest in prices uh, going down. And in fact, uh, every six or seven months or so, I'll survey the 23,000 people who receive my um, Tony's new publication uh, each week. If you want to receive that, it's a free thing each week, about 10 pages or so. Um, just go to tonyalexander.nz. Sign up, you can go for, your, go for your life there. Never go back to my website again. You'll understand when you see it. It's what you get for a $12 a month uh, uh, website. It's, I do not have a website-based uh, offering. I think I was going to say only some 13% of people actually want house prices to go down. You see, I ask people, do you want house prices to go down, increase, you know, 0 to 5%, 5 to 10, these sort of numbers, and, and the numbers are always low who actually want the prices to go down. But the answer basically is this, and I'm going to get to the answer uh, uh, in a roundabout sort of a way. Let's see, by going back to March 23. On March 23, uh, the residential property investors in New Zealand got quite a surprise when the finance minister announced that the interest uh, cost deductibility, when you work out your taxable rental income, um, would, would disappear. Uh, you couldn't get that advantage uh, any longer as any normal business person uh, could and that would apply immediately for anybody buying a, an existing property and take four years if you already had some properties and you know, you'd lose that over that period of time. And so obviously this is a fairly negative thing for residential property investors. And so I did a survey of my uh, readers um, maybe five or so days after that, 
and I had three and a half thousand people replied. And I asked them, what are you thinking about doing or changing as a result of this? And so I had all these different options there. Um, one of the, I'm going to run through three numbers here. One number uh, was, uh, or question, are you thinking about putting your rents higher now than you were previously, uh, you know, to boost your returns? And 74% of investors said, yep, I'm going to put my rents up. Now, I can look at the actual nationwide rent data and I can see an increase in the rate of growth in rents in New Zealand, but that could just be a catch up from the six months freeze of last year. So as yet, you cannot at all statistically prove that the tax changes have led to rents rising at a faster pace. So that's the first thing. Secondly, uh, we had 32% uh, of investors saying, I will not buy a property in the next 12 months that I was thinking about buying. So people looking back from making new purchases. Now that has definitely, definitely happened. The government policy has definitely caused a lot of investors not to make a, a purchase. And I can gauge that best from uh, the monthly survey I run of real estate agents around the country with REI and Z. And I've been doing this since uh, May uh, last year. And leading in to March 23, I'd usually have about uh, 15 to 60% net of the real estate agents saying, I'm seeing more investors looking to buy, you know, more, more, buy, buy, buy. Um, as soon as the March 23 announcement came in, that fell away. And over April and May, so that's where the market around New Zealand this year was at its weakest over the April, May period. I had about a net 63% of real estate agents all around the country saying, I'm seeing fewer investors. That's now minus 41%. So that's a week into lockdown. The agents are definitely saying the investors are still pulling back from the market doing their buying. So the government's had a success in that regard. But that leads me to the third question and the number there, which will help answer your, your question there, Len. I also had 25% of the 3,500 respondents say, I'm now uh, looking to sell a property over the coming uh, 12 months. And I also run a survey with a, a property management company. And each month, for three months I do this one, uh, I ask them, are you looking at uh, uh, selling a property over the next 12 months? And, and each time it's about 25% uh, have said, yes, I'm looking to sell a property. There is zero statistical evidence zero of any wave of investors selling since March 23. We've all got anecdotes, we've all heard them, but not a single piece of data I can point to and say, that looks like there's a bit of a wave of investors uh, coming through. And of course, why isn't it that we've seen investors actively selling since uh, March 2023? Well, the key reason is, of course, that uh, interest rates are still at very, very low levels. And the numbers I've run there, for instance, um, let's use the latest inflation rate 3.3%. I could sell my property and give up in Auckland the 7.7% per annum capital gain I've had since 1992, because that's what your house prices have done on average each year since 1992. I could give up 7.7% and I could sell the property, invest the money in the bank. I might get 1.2%. I'll take off tax, take off inflation at 3.3%. And I go backwards 2.5% uh, with my uh, investment, that's almost 10% difference from what I was getting before. And when inflation fairly soon hits 4.2, 4.5%, it's going to get, of course, even worse. So the investors have not been, been selling. And like I say, the market was at its weakest over April and May. Things have been coming back again. Therefore, I know this has taken a few minutes, but the answer is if the government really wants to cause house prices to fall around New Zealand, they're going to have to make investors sell, not just pull back from the buying. They would have to double down on what they announced on March 23. And I could keep rabbiting on here, but if, if I forget, remind me, Tony, go back to what you were just about to say about March 23, about what the government might do next year. But I'll put that to the side for the moment. Okay. Thanks, Tony. You probably uh, led me into my next question a little bit there because obviously we're seeing very, very low stock levels at the moment, very, very low. And yet basic economics tells you if your uh, supply is very low and your appetite to buy is still very high, you'd say the prices are not going to fall, are they? 
Yeah, well, that's the thing, of course. Um, and, and let me just re-emphasize this again. March 23 came after the LVRs being restored over April and May this year. That's when the market was at its weakest. Uh, the investors pulling back and the first home buyers going, oh, the elders, the more experienced people are pulling back. I'm scared. Maybe I'll better pull back as well. Well, now we have about a net 12% of uh, agents around the country saying, I'm seeing more first home buyers coming forward, um, including in, in Auckland as well. First home buyers maybe remember what happened with the first lockdown. Uh, the market went ballistic afterwards. And so some of them would have been hoping again, like last year, oh, maybe there's some distressed sellers. Maybe there'll be some listings. They have piled into the markets in bigger numbers since we went into lockdown. We, we now know um, um, things are, are different there. We've also got to remember that the economy is doing very, very well. The unemployment rate is now 4%. That's back to where it was at the start of 2020. Job security is strong, but it's going to get a lot stronger uh, uh, going forward. And so you put that in there, along with section prices rising strongly, uh, uh, FOMO getting going again. I've got an explicit number measuring FOMO, which I can talk about that, uh, that later on. Construction costs going up. No one in the newspapers talking about house prices falling, always about them rising, etc. And the whole ball has basically got rolling again. It's got upward momentum. And nationwide, uh, house prices have now increased another 7% since uh, March. And in uh, uh, Waitakere uh, City, the old boundary area there for uh, Auckland, um, it's about a 9% increase uh, over that period of time. So there's simply too many, I guess, positives outweighing the negatives. Oh, and of course, listings have dropped seasonally adjusted at about 14% end of August versus the end of July. As vendors have gone, oh, I'll just wait and see. When the lockdown ends, like no, there's no, uh, and spring is, is, is on us, we'll have some more listings coming forward. But again, with interest rates are still so low for putting money in a bank, most investors are going to go, yeah, nah, this has worked out okay for the past one, 10, 30 years, I'm, I'm still not convinced I need to sell. Mm, I, I agree totally. You're probably uh, going to let me into another question that I had here because uh, we're, we're seeing it uh, as well. The builders and, and developers are really struggling with, with this lack of supply of goods at the moment. And, uh, and I'm seeing or feeling that this is going to start to uh, impact on the market in, in a big way going forward. What's your feel about that? Yes, yeah, this one, um, I'm going to put it in, there's a short-term impact, which might run out for about a year, and then something interesting is going to happen in Auckland. So the short-term impact is that, um, say you're thinking about getting a house uh, built, you might have been talking with builders you know, for six months or so ago. What you're hearing now is uh, builders say, look, I just can't take your job. Um, it's not just that I'm not confident about getting materials or carpenters in the near future. Um, you know, I, I simply can't start for two years. And with all the reports about delays, um, the article in the media about a week ago about some first home buyers that are near the Kiwi built, I'm sorry, not Kiwi built, uh, 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 take your money out of your Kiwi saver fund sort of limit there. What's been happening, and I expect there's a lot more of this to come in the next few months, is some people who were looking to get something built are going to go, nah, I think we need to go back to searching on the listings again. My expectation is we're going to have, to, we are going to see more people going back into the auctions, the open homes of existing properties, because they're going to lose some hope of being able to get a property built in the near, in the near future. So that's just the first point I want to make. But there is a more important point, and this one is really going to start applying for, um, uh, I'm just guessing here, 12, 24 months or so out, house construction in Auckland is, is booming. And the best way to measure this would be the number of consents issued for new dwellings to be built, about 65, 70% of which are townhouses in Auckland now. And calculate that as a percentage of the population. Now, over the past three decades, those number of consents in Auckland versus the population, the average is 0.65%. When you look at the current number of consents in Auckland versus Auckland's current population, it's about 1.1%. Auckland is pushing towards the level of construction being, what is that, 80, 85% or so above average. Now, that is well in excess of above average production in the rest of the country. So Auckland does have 
an exceptionally firm supply uh, 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 issue uh, are coming forward. For the moment, it's not really making a difference because demand is strong. But what's going to happen is somewhere down the track, uh, a person like myself or my kids, if they were looking to buy a, a new property in Auckland, will go, I, I don't think I need to hurry. I wonder who's going to occupy all these townhouses. They're beautiful. They're going to be occupied. No two worries about that. But at some stage, the buyers will go, I think time is on my side. And so in their brain will be exactly what the vendors are thinking at the moment. I think time is on my side. I don't think I'll list my property for a while. At, at some stage, the buyers will go, I think time is on my side. Uh, let's have a rest for a few weekends and we'll look at a few other places a few weeks down the track. And it will start to switch the psychology and the market will get more balanced. And some people will talk about oversupply. Um, I'm, I'm, that's going to be a tough call, I, I, I think, given underlying population growth. Mm -hmm. But that's further out. For the rest of this year, I think the market is still going to be relatively frenzy. Buyers well outweighing uh, the vendors stepping forward. And the prices rise further. To me, it's a bit of a no-brainer. I think I'd have to agree with you there, Tony. Hey, um, the, the Reserve Bank has been um, very vocal around the fact that they want to slow things down. They want to take the heat out of the market uh, and threatening to raise the OCR. What's your feel around their strategy and, and what will happen uh, over the next, say, six to 12 months? Okay, we've got to draw a wee distinction here between changes in the official cash rate, which are primarily directed at inflation, and other tools they have available primarily directed at the housing market. And let me start with the, the inflation side here. When the Reserve Bank changes interest rates, it's largely because of our concerns about the pace of growth in the economy versus your resources, your ability to, to handle the growth and the resulting um, inflation. So if we go back to early 2019, we saw the Reserve Bank cut interest rates, their cash rate, three quarters of a percent from 1.75% excuse me, down to 1%. That was because inflation turned out to be much, much lower than they were expecting at the end of 2018 and the start of 2019. So the key point to note here is our central bank reacts to inflation numbers coming out quite different from what people are, are expecting. And what we saw on July 16 this year was the inflation number for the year to June um, increased to much more than anyone was expecting. Inflation had been 1.5%. Most of us thought, oh, when we get the June quarter number, eh, it'll be about 2.8%. It was 3.3%. And I can recall only two other times since I came back to New Zealand in 1987 when inflation has been over half a percent or you know, more than was generally expected. So that was significant, what happened two months ago. Now, on top of that, in terms of the inflation, higher than expected, um, the unemployment rate, we thought when the June quarter numbers came out, the unemployment rate would go from 4.7 to 4.4%. It's dropped to 4%. The labour market is tighter than we were thinking. That's the second thing. Thirdly, the wages growth measure, which I look at, which comes out with the employment data, it jumped from 2.7% annual growth in this wage measure to 3.4% early in a jobs recovery. Normally, it might take another 6 to 12 months, so there's wages pressure out there very early in this uh, labour market cycle. So that's the third thing. The fourth thing, fourth thing, the ANZ have a monthly business outlook survey. Oh, they run it for decades. And they ask businesses many questions, including, are you planning to put your selling prices up over the next 12 months? And over the past four months, we have had a record sort of 55 to 62 net percent of businesses saying, I'm going to put my selling prices up over the next, uh, over the coming year. We've not seen that sort of uh, pricing pressure out there before. So that's whatever that was, number four or five uh, factor. And then, of course, last week, we uh, received the economic growth numbers, GDP, gross domestic product for New Zealand for the June quarter. Eh, most of us thought the economy, eh, it probably grew maybe 1.2, 1.7% eh, was, was the top forecast. Our economy shot ahead by 2.8% in the June quarter. Our economy is growing well above its ability to do so without generating surging inflation. So the Reserve Bank should have increased interest rates maybe six or nine months ago in New Zealand, and they're going to be playing catch-up. And we would have already had them raising rates on August 18 
were it not obviously for the announcement from the Prime Minister on uh, a lockdown on August 17th. They're likely to increase their interest rates a quarter or a half a percent on October 6th. They'll hit again come November 24, probably hit again come February 23. And my warning to people is that because the Reserve Bank has to play catch up and because they, they, the inflationary pressures in New Zealand are relatively strong, borrowers should be budgeting on their short-term interest rates, floating rate, one-year fixed rate, rising maybe 2.5% from where they were you know, three months ago. Some of the rates are already up. So that'll mean the likes of the one-year fixed mortgage rate going from the low of 2.19% three months ago to maybe 5% in uh, 18 months time, something like that. And the banks have got some margins to rebuild. Their margins are below average, so they've got some margins to rebuild. So yeah, for the bulk of borrowers in New Zealand, holding the $320 billion worth of, uh, well, debt that they owe to uh, banks for housing purposes, they've not seen a monetary policy tighten recycle. They have only ever seen interest rates low and going lower. And so these rising interest rates are going to require a lot of sort of calming discussion between some of the younger borrowers, mortgage brokers, uh, real estate agents, financial advisors uh, uh, generally. So interest rates are going up and people need, need to really think about that. That's why for all last year and up until, what, four months ago, I jumped up and down like an idiot saying if I were a borrower, I would fix for five years at 2.99%. It's because central banks made a decision 18 months ago they decided to explicitly take the risk. They would cut their interest rates too far. They would keep them too low for too long. They would generate too much growth in their economies and they would generate too much inflation because getting inflation under control is actually quite easy. You just put interest rates up as high, as high, as high as needed in order to achieve it. And that's what's happening in New Zealand. Let me switch across to the housing market specifically. From February this year, the finance minister has made the Reserve Bank responsible for helping the government um, implement its housing policies. And the government has stated to the Reserve Bank, these are our two housing policies. Number one, more sustainable house prices, whatever that means. But number two, to dissuade investors from buying existing properties. That's what the government has said to the Reserve Bank. We want your help in helping us dissuade investors from buying existing properties. So that's something new from, from February. Uh, about three weeks ago, the Reserve Bank Governor said we consider house prices to be above sustainable <clears throat> sustainable levels. So he's already given their opinion that we think we're failing in helping governments in that regard. Now, while most people will think that means ah, they'll raise interest rates more than would otherwise be the case, it more applies to the other tools that they have got. Number one, the Reserve Bank has already said to banks, effective October 1, the proportion of your home lending where the deposit is less than 20%, you can, it's going from 20% to 10% of your lending. So now it's very difficult to get money from a bank if your deposit is less than 20%. And a monthly survey I do of mortgage advisors uh, is showing that basically if you are looking to buy with a low deposit, you're only going to be able to get the money from your own bank you've been using for years. No point going to a new bank. They really don't want to know about you at the moment. That's the first thing. Secondly, um, the Reserve Bank from October 1 has got new tools, new weapons the Finance Minister has given the Reserve Bank. They're going to be able to apply debt-to-income ratios. So the Reserve Bank can say to banks, you cannot lend to somebody if their total debt compared with their income, if that ratio is going to be more than something. Now, there's two banks already that have started to implement, I think it's a number of six. If the debt's six times your income, uh, they're not going to lend you the money. In the United Kingdom, it's four and a quarter times. In Ireland, it's three and a quarter. What the Reserve Bank sets, don't know. But they're probably going to use the weapon. Um, secondly, the uh, Finance Minister has also said the Reserve Bank can set maximum debt servicing ratios. So if you borrow from the bank, uh, they'll say, uh, your debt servicing cannot exceed 30 or 33 percent of your disposable um, income. The Reserve Bank could say, yeah, 25 percent. That's a new weapon. And they can also set the minimum interest rates for figuring out what that uh, is going to be out there. And the final point I'll just make here um, is that the Reserve Bank already has a distinction when it applies LVRs to investors versus owner occupiers. 
So I see there's a very good chance that when they bring in their new tools, ETIs, these sort of things, I can see that there will be different rules for investors as opposed to owner occupiers. So yeah, I think there is a little bit more that's coming along from the Reserve Bank, specifically targeted towards the housing side on top of the interest rates going up as well. Right. I guess at 5%, uh, your forecast of 5%, they're still pretty cheap, aren't they, really? So uh, that's, a, that's a good thing. But um, look, you touched on it a little bit earlier, and I, I think I know what your answer is going to be. Um, if, if you were talking to a first home buyer that uh, has pre approval right now, what would your recommendation or suggestion be? And I know there's a few listening at the moment. Okay, right. Well, I'm going to put this in terms of Auckland. And normally, I, I sort of wouldn't have anything, frankly, to say about this. Um, it would be, there's no evidence that holding off has done anybody any good price-wise for the past 30 years, apart from a brief period when the global financial crisis came along and, and you know, house prices in New Zealand fell temporarily by 11%. As a rule, the longer you wait, the higher the house price is going to go. So that's the, the first general comment I'd make. However, this is such a shortage of listings at the moment. If you are determined to make a purchase in the near future, you're not going to have much to choose from. You may have to borrow more money than you are comfortable with, but more especially, you may have to take on a property which has nothing like the attributes or in the location that you want. My expectation is that especially in Auckland, going back to where I was about 10 minutes ago, with grain supply coming forward over the next few years, that there will be a better range of choice for young people further down the track. So if, if a person has to make a, a purchase, then there's no real, real point in waiting, but there'll be a better range of choice in 12, 24, 36 months, but I don't expect that they will be cheaper. So that's the trade-off that people have to think about. But based on the uh, survey I've done for three months um, um, out there of investors, uh, one of the questions I ask is, Okay, you're an investor. Are you looking to purchase a property in the in the coming year? And if you purchase, will it be new or existing? And 55% rising percentage of investors say, if I'm going to buy, it's going to be new. I mean, you still get the tax advantages there. And it's a decrease in proportion to say, I'm going to buy existing. I also ask them then, okay, if you're buying new or existing, what type of house? Standalone, apartment, or tan townhouse? The standalone and apartment, the proportions are roughly the same for investors buying new and buying existing. It's not interesting. There's a difference on the townhouses. There is, are far more investors looking to buy new saying, I'm going to buy a townhouse than those who are looking at buying existing. And so my comment to first home buyers in Auckland is, if you want to have the greatest opportunity of making a purchase in the near future, the, the area in which you would face less competition from investors is going to be existing townhouses, not existing apartments or existing standalone houses or new houses, apartments, townhouses. It's the uh, existing townhouses. So that's something normally I wouldn't be able to throw in there, but it, it's what the survey does spit out. Yeah. I appreciate that, Tony. We're, we're experiencing what I would describe, and you know, I've been in this industry for 33 years now, uh, a feeding frenzy from both investors and developers since they changed the, uh, the guidelines with the unitary plan. And uh, people, are, and I think there might be some people that are participating today that are sitting on properties where the section size lends itself to development in the future. How do you see this market playing out? You know, do you see it really gaining more momentum than it's actually got now, or what, what's your feel for it? Okay, so this is where people maybe need to listen a little bit more carefully than what you've been listening so far, because it's slightly challenging what I'm going to say here, okay? Housing markets move in cycles. There are cycles for the speed of increase, the sales, days taken to sell a property, and construction. Um, as well. And we've seen uh, the mother of all cycles on prices. Average house prices in New Zealand have increased 37% since May last year. It's just ridiculous. I can explain the rises, FOMO, low interest rate, you know, all these sorts of things there, but it cannot continue and it won't continue. And in my opinion, we're in the end game, the end game of the boom since May last year. 
of the 160, 170% increase in average house prices from 10 years ago, and the end game of the 670% increase in house prices for the past 30 years. Let me start with the 30 year thing. Over the past 30 years, roughly in New Zealand, our population has risen 50, 50%. Stats New Zealand project for the next 30 years, roughly 27%. We're looking at a halving of population growth rate in New Zealand, country overall, and Auckland halving from what it was previously, roughly, as well. Less population growth, that's going to mean less upward pressure on prices. That's one long-term structural change. Um, number two, uh, house supply. We're now seeing the highest level of house construction in New Zealand um, as a proportion of population since back in the mid 1970s. Still not as strong as sort of 72 through to 75 um, or so, but there is a lot more supply coming forward. And that is going to be quite relevant to over the medium term, you know, five years or so. And especially, like I'm, uh, I'm guessing, 12, 18, 24 months out, people are going, I don't think I need to be in a hurry. There's a big supply response out there, and they will start to pull back from some of the new housing orders and take a little bit of time, that sort of thing. But over the long term, that would make prices a bit lower. Third factor here, so slower population growth, more supply coming forward. Third factor, interest rates. We've been seeing interest rates in New Zealand falling for three decades. From the peaks of the late 1980s, my first mortgage, 18.5%. Many of people online, I would suggest that there's always some people can gazump me on that. 23% is the usual peak for mortgage rate back in about 87 or 88. Um, we've seen nothing but interest rates falling basically over this period of time. The falls are done and dusted. This is it. The only way they're falling further is if we get maybe an entirely new pandemic or something come along and the Reserve Bank you know, cuts into negative territory. For the next three to five years, interest rates are going to be going upward. As interest rates fall, they naturally cause a repricing up of other assets like property, like shares, you know, farmland, all these other sort of things. That's ended. It's all done and dusted. So that's a third factor uh, uh, there. Um, of shorter term relevance, so this is falling into 2022 uh, relevance uh, here. Um, one reason house prices have boomed in New Zealand since May of 2020 is that we've convinced ourselves we're so fantastic at handling COVID-19, the one million silly Kiwi expats overseas wish they were back in New Zealand. They want to be back in New Zealand. Why coming back to New Zealand? I'm going to buy anything before they come back with their uh, savings from working at higher salaries overseas. So we've been buying in anticipation of people coming back, and we all know people have returned and a few more coming back. Well, I would suggest that from next year, the net migration flow for New Zealand is going to be negative. It's not going to be positive. Now, why? There's two years worth of OE of young people to catch up on. So people are going to be disappearing overseas um, for you know, a period of time for the OE. The professionals being looking to do their OE, to work in an accountancy firm in London, um, that sort of thing. Demand for labour overseas is tremendous. There's a shortage of staffing all throughout most sectors in Australia, UK, Canada, United States. And as Kiwis, we go overseas usually to escape our families. That reason probably still there in extra right now and also for higher earnings. Why the heck wouldn't you go overseas for the higher earnings that are definitely on offer, especially in Australia? And related to that, there's 650,000 Kiwis roughly in Australia. Why the heck would you look to go from Australia back to New Zealand for a higher cost of living, higher house prices, and, and reduced wages? It's simply not gonna happen. So that's a thing that's gonna be start to come into play of net migration. We'll be talking about it again at the same time as interest rates going up, um, house supply going up as well. And let me throw in another factor here. This is the one I said I'd be coming back to um, earlier on. The government has expressed major concern, as all of us have, about housing affordability. There's no way they will be pleased with house prices rising 37% from May last year, or 7% since they tightened up the criteria, the taxation back on March 23. House prices are up another 7%, 9% out by Takeri, old day area, for, for instance. So my warning from a few days after March 23 has been this. Investors had better darn well hope that by the time we get into early 2022, the annual pace of house price growth in New Zealand has slowed to less than 10%. Because if it hasn't, the government's going to hit again. The Reserve Bank, when they're raising interest rates, they'll keep hitting and hitting and hitting until they get the response they want. And I think the government's going to do the same thing with its taxation policies on residential property investors. They've hit once, 
with the um, tax changes. And I think they will look to hit again next year, simply because house prices are so high, um, they haven't achieved their goal, and I think you know the annual numbers are still going to be running well above 10% in early next year. So that, I think, is going to be a change. That, and they'll be looking to maybe try and encourage some selling by the investors. And how might they do that? I'll make my final comment here before passing back to yourself, Lee. They stripped away your ability to deduct interest expense. They may go, what the hell? Let's strip out everything else. Let's take away your ability to deduct your rates, your insurance, your maintenance costs, your, your property management fees. Look, I don't know. I have no inside hearing knowledge of any of this happening. But when you're looking at a majority Labour government failing abysmally on a number of its policies, I'm assigning this sort of scenario above a 50% probability. So it's not certain, but I, I think that's something investors need to keep an eye out for um, next year. We'll see. Yeah, interesting learning there, mate. Um, hey, look, you've got quite a few questions in your chat box. I don't, are you capable of opening that yourself, or do you want me to? If you could do that, yeah, yeah, no, I always leave that for the person doing the organisation. So you, you have a little look through there and sort some of the best ones out, to, uh, Len. Stick, oh, yeah. your, stick your hand up when you're ready to ask me one. Yeah. And yep, I'll just uh, uh, throw in maybe some other comments. Uh, okay. my... <laughs> Matt has asked, uh, I have 700,000 on flooding. What should I do with uh, when looking at rates? Oh, okay. Well, I can't answer that uh, uh, directly. Uh, what you should have done is take a notice of what I was saying last year and up until three or four months ago, uh, I was saying to people, do not take the candy. The candy was, of course, the 2.19% one-year mortgage rate that was there. Um, I was saying to people, I would fix 2.99% for five years. Now, at the moment, it looks like about two-thirds of people are favouring the three-year term, fixing three years, because I think that's around about 3.5%. For five percent, a few are also favouring the two-year term, so two and three years most popular. Hardly anybody's interested in four years or, or five years, and definitely one year, not much interest at all there. So you know, may, maybe then you should give consideration, like other people, towards fixing over maybe a two, three, maybe out towards a four-year term. And just keep in mind here that um, not a single economist on the planet has a good record of forecasting interest rates. For any country since 2007, there's a high level of uncertainty. You know, the pandemic, how does it go? Don't exactly know. What happens with uh, with uh, China, their economy slowing down a bit because of some property problems there for a moment? Uh, we don't know. So maybe you look to spread your risk a bit um, rather than fixing all at one term, which is what I personally have always done, but maybe spread it across two or three uh, different terms there. Most people are looking at around about three years. And let me just give one insight into why I jumped up and down like such an idiot saying I'd fix five years. People have fixed one year because if this is the, the yield curve, one year interest rate down here, two, three, out to five year interest rates, people have fixed one year in New Zealand for so long because it's been cheaper than any other term. There will be a point in the interest rate cycle within the next three years when the curve is like that and the short term interest rate will be a lot higher than the long-term interest rate. What happens then is people will forsake fixing one year at 5% and they'll lock in five years at a rate they wouldn't touch with a barge pole at the moment. That's the danger of continuing to roll one year, which has worked spectacularly since 2008. Just be aware that's going to come along when the yield curve goes negative some stage in the next next three years. Okay. Um... There was a question from Gaston, uh, and I think it's in relation to the New Zealand dollar. Uh, what do you, what do you, what's your forecast or thoughts around that? Any market news? Yeah, my view on the Kiwi dollar is uh, trending upwards over the next uh, maybe 12 months or, or so, because interest rates in New Zealand will be increased well in advance of other countries. I mean, look at us against the Aussie dollar. We are pushing 97 cents against the, the Aussie, um, with uh, the Reserve Bank of Australia still stressing they do not anticipate raising interest rates until maybe late 2023, 2024. Similar wording coming out of the Federal Reserve in the United States, whereas we're looking at an interest rate increase here in New Zealand, of, what is that, a couple of weeks um, or so away, two, two and a half weeks away. So the interest rate differential will move in favour, I think, of the Kiwi dollar going upward. So far, the upward pressure on the Kiwi dollar formula has been pretty mild for us against the yen, pound, the euro and the US dollar. But against the Aussie dollar, 
the way things are going, we might be back to parity again in the near future. That's a big call, a call which has been wrong for most people over the past few decades. Um, but generally, I see the Kiwi dollar going upward until the markets view a interest rate rises as imminent in the United States in particular. That point will come, and then I would expect the Kiwi dollar to start dipping back down again. But m maybe that's 12 months away. So I think Kiwi dollar rising over the next 12 months or so. Thanks, Tony. Uh, Don's asked a question. Do you see the government and council releasing more land to increase supply? Releasing more land to increase supply? I, I don't know if they will. I mean, Auckland, 80%, I understand, of the area and the boundary can actually be scraped and townhouses or whatever go on it. So I don't know if land supply is such a big issue in Auckland. Around the rest of the country, now that's interesting. Let me repeat what I said earlier. Housing markets move in cycles. Cycles predominantly are driven by the psychology, how we feel in our head. Once we think something is going to be in short supply, toilet paper, puppies going into lockdown, boom, we hoover the whole thing up, the flour, the sugar, the baking powder, or whatever. At the moment, all around New Zealand, there is a shortage of sections um, because we have anticipated Kiwis coming back. We've bought the sections. We want to build because buying so it's so expensive. And the supply in the pipelines for local authorities, it's all been dried up. The, they, they have to scramble now and try and rezone property from rural to residential, organise the services, the infrastructure going out there, all these sort of things. It can take a period of time and it will eventually happen. And at some point, the section price cycle will go back the other way. I don't know when that's going to happen. I, I can't forecast FOMO in terms of buying houses or buying sections. But at the moment, I certainly know from speaking with some developers who've been around a long time and seen these sort of frenzies versions of them before, there's a point at which you step back, you go, the land just seems a bit too expensive. There's a lot of inexperienced people in there thinking they can make a quick buck. And that would be one of the signs the um, experienced people look for. And I, I spoke with some people late last year. They felt that Auckland was there then. They were wrong. I've seen the same thing in Queenstown over the years as well. But there's got to be a point at which people go, I'm, I'm just going to I'm going to wait this out. I think maybe the section prices will go up further, but I think there's a correction somewhere down when more land is made available. And maybe that's something the government might look at again, trying to accelerate, because certainly it worked in Canterbury after the earthquake. Up until 2015, house prices in Canterbury, yeah, they increased the same as everywhere else. It was nothing major. But since 2015, house prices haven't risen all that much in Canterbury, Christchurch, versus the rest of the country. It's not because of building materials prices or the size of the house or anything like that getting built. It's because of the section prices. Since 2015, when uh, the local authorities down there had to free up mega years of uh, land rezoned from residential, sorry, rural to residential. Since then, Canterbury house prices have only increased about 20% versus 70% plus for the country as a whole. So if you free up land supply, it definitely makes an impact on, on um, house prices. Um, but I don't know if there's anything extra coming forward in, in Auckland or, or not. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Naraj asks, what do you think will be the impact of another longer lockdown or slower COVID recovery on the interest rates going forward? Yeah, it'll make the housing market bounce even more strongly on the way out. The difference of this lockdown from the first one is, is that now we know what happens when we go into lockdown and what happens afterwards. Previously, we had the foggiest idea. Anybody online here, you had as much idea of what was going to happen as all the economists and politicians and the Federal Reserve in the United States, UK, um, etc. Now we know we panic by toilet paper, we panic by pets, and then we go and panic by each other's houses. And for those of you who are bosses, later on we panic higher staff as well, people to work in your, in your businesses. We know these things happen. And you look at the commentary coming out of Australia, it's certainly pretty pretty dour in terms of their economies in Sydney, Melbourne, you know, New South Wales, Victoria, but there's full expectation that when they open up again, voom, voom, they're going to recover quite quickly. And I would suggest that would be the same thing in New Zealand as well. We'll see a recovery which will be relatively quick. The Reserve Bank knows that. But if we see this outbreak worsen and Auckland remains in lockdown and the position is reached where the only way out is to copy the governments of New South Wales and Victoria and vaccinate your way, your way out. 
then that will certainly keep the Reserve Bank, I think, on hold again in October 6, and then they'll have the mother of all catch-ups after that. So that, that's my expectation. It's just a temporary impact. If we, you were to stay in lockdown for longer and if it spreads to the Waikato, based on uh, this morning's news, then the government will probably free up more money. I don't know about the Reserve Bank doing any extra sort of lending assistance. They are going to be basically shit scared about the inflation, which is already in the system, and what's going to come forth next year. Mm, interesting. Uh, Reserve Bank, uh, I know this is a little bit of crystal ball, but anyway, I'll ask the question. What if uh, the government changes? Uh, do we know anything about what National would be proposing? <laughs> oh, excuse me. Uh, about the uh, housing market and interest rates in the room. Uh, okay, <laughs> right, yeah. <clears throat> Um, I've been strongly expressing an opinion since six months ago when I gave a briefing to the National Party Caucus on the economy and housing market in particular, and, and the, the opinion I've been expressing is, keep your mate, no chance, um, given that they are more intent on fighting themselves. The body language I saw in the room was was not pretty, shall we say. Um, and that now, I think, is, is coming out in the media commentary, um, it's, et cetera. So my belief is because uh, while I have some issues with the Prime Minister, I give her really high marks on handling this uh, global pandemic. I feel glad she's actually there um, at this time. Um, I think they will win re-election in two years' time. So now a part of you is going, oh, oh, bugger, we're going to have to wait a bit longer for National to come in. I assume National is back in five years' time. Okay, jump forward to two years' time at the next election. It's probably not going to be a majority Labour government as we have at the moment. Oh, so they're going to be restrained? Not if they have to have the Greens in coalition to get a government. We're maybe not talking New Zealand first like before. If it's Labour, Greens, you think you've got it bad now as a property investor? <laughs> what the hell would they do then? Um, yeah, that would be interesting. So that's that's why partly why I'm saying I feel this is the end game for the big increases in house prices, not the housing investment. If you've been in for decades, you've seen hard times in the past. These things can't come around. Um, but in terms of the big increases in prices, 37% over, what was that, 14, 15 months, uh, 170% 10 years, 670% for 30 years, those are just about done and dusted. Uh, things are going to slow down to maybe it's not 6.7% per annum nationwide going forward, and maybe it's 4.5%, maybe it's 5 to 5.5% 5 .5 average capital gain in Auckland. That's all I'm talking, but just allow for sometimes cycles go a bit too high and there is a bit of a give back once you come off the peak a bit further out. So, yeah, I'm sorry about that. I'm assuming National don't get in until five years out, and two years will be interesting because Labor will probably have to rely on the Greens. I think you just gave some people nightmares, mate, so thank you for that. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, Nishud asks, uh, do you reckon CCCFA is going to have any impact on the property market? Okay, good. Yeah, thank you for that one. Um, each uh, month with mortgages.co.nz, uh, sort of a, a mortgage uh, information uh, site out there, I do a survey, been doing that since ooh, about 15 months or so, and I ask the mortgage advisors, uh, numerical sort of indicators there, and then just to express their opinion on how are they seeing bank lending policies towards first-home buyers and towards investors. And so in my publications for this Thursday, Tony's View and TV Premium, I'll have uh, different versions of the comments that I've made on lending to first-time buyers and the policies. And this overwhelming thing to come through this time around, there was a bit last month and a bit a month ago, but definitely strongly, is talk about the CCC, FA, the credit, whatever, lending to um, uh, people generally. The banks are going to have to make a lot more effort to make sure that when they lend to a person, they have fully gone through all of their expenses and they are fully confident that that person can service the mortgage. Now, that's one reason when they work out your ability to service the debt, they don't do it at the 3.5% they lend to you. They, they use a 7% interest rate or whatever the Reserve Bank will tell them to use in the future. Um, the comments coming through were that uh, even if people say, okay, yeah, I've been boozing it up quite hard over the past two years, they can see it in the statements, but now I'm going to change. Now I won't be doing that. And so, therefore, I will have good uncommitted income, UMI, uncommitted monthly income, and so I'll qualify for a mortgage. The banks aren't listening to that. They'll say, prove it. Show me three months of changing your spending habits, and then maybe I'll give you finance. That seemed to be the strongest thing which was, which was coming through related to triple CFA. That 
application of the new rules has been delayed from October 1 to December 1 because of um, the lockdown. That won't really make all that much difference to the banks. They like to keep the Reserve Bank happy. Um, they like to obey legislation. They like to be ahead of the curve. So that really doesn't make too much difference. It's already been applied out there. Yes, it's having an impact, and it, it seems to mainly be impacting, quite frankly, the first home buyers. Um, the first home buyers have already been hit by maximum 10% of bank home mortgage lending can now be low deposit versus 20% uh, before, and about 75% of the low deposit lending is to first home buyers. So that's already hit them. Triple CFA is going to hit them harder as well. Government's going to be looking to offset these two hits, or oh, three with interest rates going up, to the young buyers over the next few months. It actually increases the probability of, of an anti-investor change again, March something next year. Okay. Uh, Hagun, uh, hope I've uh, said that right. Do you uh, ask the question, do you see an increase in overseas investment for Kiwi investors? In other words, taking their money overseas. Ah, okay, yeah, no, no, exactly the opposite. I've got a list, I've got a list in front of me here of, um, based on the surveys that I do every month, you can see I've got a unique data set out there. It's not RBNZ stuff, it's not Stats New Zealand stuff, with these sort of five, I think it's five monthly surveys I've got doing, and I can compare this lockdown one week into its surveying real estate agents with the last lockdown, the first survey was in May. And some of the differences are there. First of all, FOMO, fear of missing out, a lot stronger. In the first survey of May last year, 35% of agents said, I'm seeing FOMO, fear of missing out on the part of buyers. That's 71% now. That's totally different, stronger than the first lockdown. Um, back then, a net 17% of agents said, prices are falling in my area. Now, a net 59% are saying they're rising. And one reason is back then, agents said, 48% of agents said, my clients are worried about losing their jobs. That's only 12% now. But to answer your question, I also ask, um, are you seeing more or fewer investors buying? Back then it was 16% saying more investors. Now it's a net, I've already mentioned this number, 41% of agents saying there's fewer investor buyers. So that's a big change. And the other one is on offshore inquiries. You see, we Kiwis, we like to think the rest of the world is paying attention to us. We love it when we are on that, was it Colbert's uh, a comedy show or, or that sort of thing? And we get so far up ourselves, where we don't see the sunshine for a great period of time. And so we've convinced ourselves, all these people overseas want to buy in New Zealand. And during last year's lockdown, we looked at all the media articles about the, the hits on the websites from overseas. And in my first survey of agents, May last year, 8%, uh, a net 8% of agents said, I'm seeing more inquiry from overseas. Now a net 39% are saying, I'm seeing less inquiry from overseas. And it's been that way, worsening uh, for much of this year. If I'm overseas, why the hell would I want to come back to New Zealand when the rest of the world is learning to live with COVID and we're still getting our, we haven't really embraced that concept as yet, when there's massive demand for me to work overseas and they're offering me extra money to stay in London, etc. So no, I am not expecting at all that we're going to see some sort of increase in inquiry and purchases in New Zealand from overseas. I expect the flow is going to go the other way. And let me just mention something I've not mentioned at all before. One reason house prices have boomed since lockdown last year is people who were thinking of young people say, I'm going to travel, travel, binge, then buy a house. I don't know when I'll be able to travel. Let's reverse it. I'm going to buy my house and then somewhere down the track, travel, travel, binge. We, in the next three months, are going to see that turning. People are going to go, it's too hard. We're going to go on big trips overseas the next three years, and then we'll look to buy a property in you know, three or four years' time. That is going to be one extra factor, slowing the housing market down, starting maybe early next year when we, we're going to go overseas. Another survey I do ask people, are you going to go overseas? How quickly? 46% of the people responding there, about 1,500, um, are saying, I'm going to go overseas within the next 12 months once the borders open up, just for your guide. Okay. This this is another one from Hagan, actually. Uh, is it a good idea to uh, hold a property for the 10 years to uh, avoid the bright line rules, or what's your take on that one? Don't have a view on that. It comes down to personal circumstance and talking to, a, to, to your property accountant. So, yeah, sorry, I don't have a view on that. Okay, any, is there any evidence out there that uh, capital is moving into the commercial 
sector uh, out of residential? Any evidence you've seen? Okay, there's certainly strong interest, especially in the various managed uh, uh, funds, PFG, uh, uh, sort of PNG, I think, sorry, uh, different groupings out there. You see the advertisements in the paper, Oyster uh, offering things. There was also the cherry farm thing. So there's money looking for exposure in the farming sector and in the commercial sector, definitely. And some vehicles have been set up to channel that money to make, you know, purchases. So, yes, there is some movement out there. Um, however, for many residential property investors, if they're looking to do it off their own bat, they pretty quickly learned, learn that commercial is not the same as residential. Commercial is heavily focused on the individual site, the range of tenants that can go into it. You've got earthquake strengthening, you've got to pay a hell of a lot more attention um, um, to um, fit out costs you may have to do if you need a new tenant. There can be extended periods of time without tenants. So it's certainly not for everybody. And maybe the, the best way I can approach this is um, go into my website, tonyalexander.nz, go to the publications page, and um, I should have a link on there where, about, right near the top of that publications page. Where's your spending money gone? I sent out a special survey a uh, couple, two or three weeks ago asking people, if you uh, were going to travel overseas and didn't, what did you do with your money? And I had about, again, 1,500 people reply on that. And 26% of people said, ah, I devoted that money towards domestic travel, 20% to home renovations, 18% said I've saved it, 12% paid off debt, 12% bought cars, 47% um, is saved is, is one thing. About 12% went into housing. So I can make an estimate, there's about $1.2 billion dollars extra has gone into housing this past year of the reallocated travel money. Commercial property, some people did mention they went into commercial property, but it was way, way down the list. It wasn't a big number. Therefore, my ultimate view based on these sort of indicators, some money has gone into commercial property. Um, there's definitely more money looking to buy commercial than commercial properties exist, but the bulk of people definitely sticking with, res with residential. Okay, one final question here. Um, if you're saying the boom is coming to an end, what is your advice to the potential sellers that are tuned in today? Oh, I don't have any advice to give, okay. Uh, my recommendation would get yourself a good uh, a real estate uh, agent. I ble believe, oh, I wonder what agency that will be. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, my belief is that when Auckland's out of lockdown, there'll be more listings coming forward. It's spring. It's sort of the second busiest time of the year for settlements after March, uh, uh, for instance. So there is that. Uh, the FOMO is still exceptionally strong and will remain strong for the remainder of this year. But remember, housing markets move in cycles. This cycle, it's, it's not yet tired by other sort of feelings I've had in the past, but I think we are in the end game. And the clever person, as they say, is always prepared to leave the last bit of a cycle on the table for the last ballot. You know, don't try and pick the top. Yes, no, it's the top of the cycle. This one we should be. Oh, turn your microphone off, please. Or the bottom of the cycle are there. So I think there's a bit left on the upside. But the professional investors, they've already been selling off, as I said to the media back in February, they've been selling off their crap for a period of time, stuff that will never meet healthy homes or need new roofs, that sort of thing. I think it's a good opportunity still if you have properties which are of your lesser quality, lower returning, I still think there's a good opportunity to offload some of those in a good environment for maybe the next six, six months. But just be aware that Auckland in particular is the mother of all construction booms going on. You've not seen it since the 1970s. And at some point, discussion about that will overwhelm the general FOMO and got to buy sort of feeling out there. I don't have a psychological model that can pick when that's going to happen, but I have thrown in 12 to 18 months out. Final comment. Lynn, come on. Well, thank you so much, Tony. And look, well, I know there'll be more questions and people will be thinking of more stuff after we finish this, but uh, we can't go on forever. Um, I think it's it's really important that I say, look, I, I just value all the uh, wisdom that you have on board. And I think most people here now are going away from this webinar way more uh, better informed on what might be happening in the future. And I know it's all crystal balling stuff and all that sort of thing, but the reality is 
I think what I said at the beginning, you do more research on uh, the important things than anyone else, and I, I really value that. But the other thing I, I love about what you do, mate, is you deliver it with such passion and energy, and, uh, and it's kind of uh, gives you a, a lot more confidence in whatever uh, you're thinking. So once again, we really do thank you so much for giving up your time and being with us today. We really appreciate it. And uh, look, if you've got more questions, fire them into us, and we will actually get them to Tony, and uh, he might take the time to, uh, to make the time to actually uh, give a reply. So. Once again, thanks very much, Tony. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Dean. Thanks, everybody. And good luck up there.